Welcome to Dreamers to Leaders, keeping it real with Melody Podcast. Melody is a classic dreamer who started as a flight attendant and worked her way to now a tech fashion trendsetter, thought leader, and dynamic entrepreneur in various industries. This podcast is for the dreamers and doers. Learn how to think, act, and speak big as business leaders share how they turned from dreamers to leaders. Hello and welcome to the Dreamers to Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Melody. Our guest today is an executive relationship expert. He helps men and women in the C-suite level elevate or save their relationship using love-based relationship method. He was originally from Germany and is now based in Malibu, California. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Arno Koch. Hey, Arno. Welcome to the show. Hey, Melody. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's begin. If you could uh, share with our audience your backstory on how your life was before making those decisions to be an executive relationship coach. What were those uh, moments in your life that led you to being a specialist in relationship? Yeah, um, I'll touch very very briefly on, on childhood. It's, that's probably where I was set up for that. Uh, my parents never had a con- concept of handling conflict amicably, what I would say. A lot of uh, yelling, shouting, uh, blaming, ye- labeling going on as kids were, were physically disciplined. Um, the word divorce was on the table. And I remember sitting between my parents in the living room and mediating arguments. Being oh, afraid that they would follow through that divorce threat and also being in, in fear that the family would be torn apart. Um, and, and my love and compassion goes out to everyone who blames themselves for their parents' divorce because I felt I had an impact. And if they ha- had gotten divorced, they, they didn't in the end. Um, and, and still going, still going for over, way over 40 years. I think almost almost 45 years now they're married. Um, I would have blamed myself, absolutely. And that's also how I got into personal development because at some point as a teenager, I realized that I was that I was talking the same way that didn't get me results. So I read my first book on personal development uh, as at age about, I think, 15 or so. Um, and I was always passionate about personal development, but then I... Um, became an engineer in Germany, worked as an engineer and uh, worked my way through the corporate ladder, became a product manager, um, and then in business development here in California, which which led me to the US. And then when my expat contract ended, I would have been able to go back to Switzerland. But at that point, I had learned to know my wife. And uh, I said, no, I'm going to stay here. And, and at that point, I realized how I could turn my passion into a profession. And that's when I became a became a coach, business coach at the time. And then something interesting happened as I worked with my first clients. Their relationships were in a tough spot. The word divorce was on the table. And Mm -hmm. at the end of the coaching program, they were happily in love again. And I was like, how did that happen? We didn't talk about relationships. I didn't speak a word with their partner, but still this happened. So then then I looked at how, how I coached them. I looked into the content of of my coaching. And what I did was I had them practice all the things because also communication and also business problems are also often communication problems or or, or mainly. Um, So I had them practice everything with their kids and with their spouses. As they elevated their communication with their partner, now their partner was exposed to a different environment, right? Them being part of the environment of their partner. And now their partner had to respond to that new environment to that new language that was that was spoken with them, and that inevitably elevated the relationship. And uh, when I noticed that, I was like, this, see, this is so powerful. I don't know anyone who works with people like that. And I started calling myself the couples coach who doesn't work with couples with couple. and, uh, <laughs> and started helping people in tough spots in a relationship whose partner didn't want to be involved. You know, I like that. Um because a lot of people, I think, always have this notion that you always have to drag your partner to be in a couple's therapy, right? So what you're saying is, no, not necessarily. Because I believe that everything has to come from you first, right, for that individual. We cannot 
ever <laughs> change anyone. And it's going to be uh, a fairy tale to think that you could with a, with a magic wand change a person. Yeah. But um, with internal work and the desire, you know, for the person to really change and understand and more than uh, with that it's almost like um osmosis right or you're kind of set emitting whatever joy that you have and somehow you know you attract you know the right people or repel <laughs> yeah yeah exactly okay. repel the wrong people and when you try to bring your partner into couples counseling there's often this notion of oh they want the the coach or therapist to, to adjust some screws in my head. They think I need to get fixed or they're looking for a relationship judge and and people don't want that, right? Yes. On the other hand, if someone asks me, hey, my partner wants to go to couples counseling, I always say, yes, go, go with them because in the end, they will evolve. They will learn as much as you will and they also need your support in doing that understand it as they needing your support and the, the the therapist the coach if they know their 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 craft um they will help you elevate your relationship and help both of you grow mm -hmm. so so let's address the uh, the elephant in the room right that there are 44 percent in 2022 that's the divorce uh, expectancy in the u.s mm. so why is that a daunting number Yeah. So the the last divorce statistic that I looked into was, was talking about average 50%, right? But it was really interesting to look a little bit deeper because it's about 40% of first marriages and then it's 60% of second marriages and about 73% of third marriages that fail. Those oh. people are just repeating their patterns And hoping that a Mr. Right, a Mrs. Right will fix that. Yeah. And it's the other person's problem while they repeat their pattern and just meet the same person with a different face and a different name and a different hair color. Right. So taking responsibility and changing your ways is the way mm -hmm. to elevate the relationship. Right. right? right, right. So, and that so growth must trickle down and have ripple effects. So marry yourself first, right? <laughs> and know <laughs> that, um, you know, learn to be happy. You learn to be, um, to find joy within you and just find a partner to share that joy, right? Versus finding someone to bring that joy in your life. Right, yeah. Arno? Yeah. A relationship is a co-creation of two individuals, right? And both partners have an influence and can make a difference. But it's also a choice. It's a daily choice. And a divorce is also a co-creation. So there's always, there's nobody to blame, right? It's not like all responsibility is on me, like a 500-pound anvil, all, why is all responsibility on me? No, it's not. But it's your responsibility. You have the responsibility playing on the sem semantics to clean your side of the road and have a positive impact and influence the situation. And being two individuals reminds me of, of, of happiness, right? You want to be happy. You want to be happy as a person, as an individual, right? You want to be able to be happy on your own, but you also want to make your partner happy. Uh -huh. And there are gurus out there that say, look, it's, it's about two happy people coming together. You can't make each other happy. You choose your feelings. Your feelings are a matter of your perception of what the other person does. And although there is a little bit of truth to it, it's, it can also be very toxic. Because if I make my wife feel a certain way, and she tells me, and I tell her, well, that's only your perception, that's a toxic thing to do. Mm. That's very toxic. Because in the end, I do make her feel. And I can prove that because if you send your partner a text message, the second they read it, they will feel something. And that's not a choice. That is unconscious and immediate feeling that comes up. As they respond and you read the response, you feel something. 
Or if you notice they haven't responded in the time frame you expected, you will also feel something, right? And it's unconscious and immediate, and they have made you feel. Now, then you can reframe and and work with those emotions and, and look deeper into it. But that initial feeling came from them. They did it. And as the person doing something, I need to have response to take responsibility for making my partner feel and acknowledge that. Huh. Well, and, but, um, okay. Anyway. So maybe I'm not catching it, but, um, I can't be responsible for, for what my, okay. I can't be responsible for what a person feels. If let's say my intention, let's say, <laughs> is to make you happy, let's say, right? So I want my partner to be happy. If the person perceives it that way, would it that would that be not my problem? That's their problem, or um, or that's where the problem lies, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because we cannot control, we cannot control how they would perceive it, or we cannot have it's a true. Ball. So 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 help me with that. But we we do have an influence, right? When you express gratitude, when you express appreciation, there's a good chance that your partner will feel better in that moment, right? When you, right. when you thank them for something they, they, they did, it would be very surprising if that did not have a positive effect on their mood. Mm-hmm. So for example, if you say, Hey, I'm going to clean the, the, the kitchen tonight. It's fine. You don't need to do anything. They'll be happy about that. If they say that you'll be happy about that as well. If you walk into the kitchen two hours later and the kitchen is clean, you'll be happy too. You'll feel something in that moment. If you walk into that kitchen and the kitchen is not clean, then you will feel something different. Right, right, right. So so I agree. Uh, there is obviously um, an influence on what you do um, for your partner to feel a certain way, right? Um, uh, you mentioned something, I think, in one of uh, your write-ups or a write-up about you where he said, there's no such thing as business relationship or business relationship problem or relationship problem. It's a personal, it's a yeah. personal problem, right? Yeah. So you want to expound on that, Arno? Yeah, yeah. There, there are no business problems and no relationship problems. They're only personal problems that reveal themselves in our business and our relationships. Right. And in other words, how you do something is how you do everything. We have a certain method of communicating with other people. And mm-hmm. we do that in business and in relationships. And that's what happened with my, with my first business client, um, where they had, for example, one of them, one of them had a problem with authorities. She would freeze in the presence of authorities. And that happened with her husband. And that also happened in, in, in a business situation. Mm-hmm. With, with bosses, with, with, with clients, with authority. Mm-hmm. And changing the way she showed up in those, in those crucial conversations, in those moments of conflict, showing up confidently, um, changed the communication with her partner and also in the business situations. So let's talk about communication, because I believe that with anything in any relationship, it's how it's how we skin the cat, right? <laughs> yeah. Ways to to uh, effectively communicate with your with your partner. Uh, what are some tips uh, that you can share with our audience to to have uh, an effective communication with uh, with a partner? Yeah, um, for once, it's expressing empathy and compassion. And empathy and compassion for me was always kind of a mystery, right? It, it is this, this shared feeling. You feel something and I feel what you feel or sense what you feel. But that doesn't mean that you know that I do that, right? So if I get how you feel and I tell you how you feel and it's true and you like it, you feel the empathy, right? You know that I get it. You, you, you feel good about it. If I'm just a little bit off, it breaks the connection because I'm wrong. I didn't get it. And if I get how you feel, but you don't like how you feel, it also breaks the connection. Like, why are you angry? I'm not angry. Right? You know, like, so 
there's an easy way to express empathy that helps the other partner feel understood and, and, and get and got uh, while leaving yourself some wiggle room and maybe being wrong. And that is starting the sentence, starting that expression of empathy and compassion with it seems like, it looks like, or it sounds like. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah, in, so instead of yeah. saying, why are you angry, saying it seems like you're frustrated about something right now. Mm-hmm. Or it seems like you're frustrated with what I did right now. And what it does, it does three powerful things. Number one, as you say, it seems like you're not mansplaining or womansplaining their feelings to them, but you're showing you might be wrong. And that goes a long way. You also show that you put some effort in. I thought about it, I thought about it, and it seems like I really tried. And then frustrated about something, instead of saying, you're the problem because you're feeling bad, I'm the problem because I'm thinking that you feel negatively. I show that you have a valid negative feeling about something that happened. And that initiates and and promotes to open up and and talk about the topic instead of stonewalling or escalating. So it's it's a very powerful tool that I've actually actually read in a book that had nothing to do at all with relationships. It's by by Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. Uh And he so, uses, so you're, you're good. Oh, no, I like that. I like the, you know, you started with not being factual, like you're already blaming and, um, and, and seeming to say that, that this is it. You're leaving room, as he said, uh, as to, you know, I want to understand more type of thing, right? Yeah. I want to understand. So, uh, and they also say you have to start with, Instead of you, you did it, or you're like this, it's I, right? I feel like there's something off, perhaps. <laughs> you yeah. start with the I. <laughs> it seems to me, it seems to me that, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and making it your, your perception that can be wrong. Yeah. Hey, right. hey um, Arno, a lot of people I know, I have this client that... Um, that introduced me to the languages of love uh, years ago. He's always been in love, you know, with, with his wife. And um, and I remember him being in love, and he's already like in his 60s or early 70s. I, I, I forgot, but he was already up there. And then the, the wife passed on, right? Mm. So he was devastated, but it wasn't long, maybe two years he called again and said, Hey, Melody, I, I needed to change my policies, et cetera. We need to add Mary, you know, the, the, the new wife hmm. and, um, and checking in with him. So he would call from time to time. And again, he's again madly in love. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, he seemed to have perfected, you know, how it is to be just really passionately exude that. You know, the love mm-hmm. for another human being. You yeah. know, so it's not just a fluke with the first, because mm-hmm. the second one, it seemed like that as well. Um, and then, yeah, he said, uh, the languages of love, um, helped him. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I think the five love languages are very powerful. I think they're very, very powerful and, um, they can be a good, a good, basis to expressing appreciation because that's that's what they help do express appreciation so that the other person understands it and one thing that is very important and just for the for the for for the uh, listeners it's touch gifts quality time words of appreciation acts of service are the five love languages and um it goes both ways. And I believe every single relationship piece of relationship advice goes full circle. And that means, for example, when I understand that my partner's love language is gift and mine is not, then I speak more gift, right? And give more gift. On the other hand, I can't expect that other person to stop giving me gifts and only do my, my thing. I also start to understanding 
her gift or his gift as the act of love. It changes how I express myself and it changes how I understand wow. them. It goes both ways. I agree. And, and, and otherwise it can be, it can be even detrimental when you receive a gift and say, come on, we talked about the love languages and you know, I'm, I don't care about gifts. And now you're giving me a gift again. I, you know, that, that's, that's, that sounds rather <laughs> toxic, right? <laughs> or on the other hand, demanding it, like someone says, Hey, could you do this and that? And you say, yeah, I, I love to do that, but not right now. Give me 10 minutes. And you say, Oh, but you know that acts of service is my love language. Don't you love me? So there is a toxicity to it if you misinterpret those five love languages. But that aside, they're a very powerful way to um, to express appreciation. And what what your client did, and I want to expand a little bit on that because you have you can feel love and you can be in love, right? Mm -hmm. And I sometimes speak with people who say, "Yeah," and it's a dreaded thing that can happen in a, in, a, in a marriage where someone says. My partner says she loves me, but she's not in love with me anymore. Or I do still love my partner, but I I think I'm not in love with her anymore. What can I do? Right? As as if as if that happens. As if that is that is a coincidence that 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 happened. And there is one has a lot of leverage to to work with that. And this is something that your client apparently is 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 really doing very well. Because love is not only a noun, it's also a verb. When you love, you express that love. And when you look at the, when you really go into the weeds and look at that expression of love, that can be cleaning up a kitchen, right? But of course, cleaning up a kitchen is not, that doesn't mean, well, I cleaned the kitchen up for my sister and my mother, right? Uh, I mean, those are people I love too, but I've been a guest at so-and-so's house and I cleaned up the kitchen. So cleaning up the kitchen is not necessarily an expression of love, but you express love in a variety of, of ways and the five love languages are some. And here's what happens when you stop expressing love, you feel it less. When the other person stops expressing love, you also feel it less. The other way around when you express love more, you feel it more, and the other person feels it more. So I sometimes say, I believe in cause and effect, but I don't necessarily know what comes first. And if I feel I'm falling out of love, or my partner says she's not in love, I need to do something. I need to express more love. And that means expressing more appreciation, expressing more gratitude, um, uh, first, first and foremost, doubling down on, on those things. On those things, I agree. Uh, yes, definitely, it's a verb. So if you're feeling that you're falling out of love, then you show more love, and somehow it'll spiral back to being in love, I, I feel. And um, I heard someone say, I think it was a rabbi or, or someone that seems you know, with authority, and he's saying, you know, it's unfair. It's unfair that, you know, you have to be, like, in love, in love for, for the relationship to be, um, to work. Because first and foremost, it's a decision, right? It's first and foremost a decision that you want to be married, that you want to stay married. And, and therefore, that's a commitment and dedication to that decision that you want to stay married, right? Because otherwise... With everything that happens, a whirlwind of life, right? You, we can go like this, but if you really want to have that goal of, of being married and and being happily married, then it's a choice. It's a decision. Yeah. Right? So that's why I agree with you. You know, yes, you can have couples couples therapy, but you could do it with you first because you personally have to make a decision. And I think that's what my client did. He made a decision day one that I'm going to be happily married. Yeah. And it's pouring. You know, every time I, I talk to him, I think it was even one time that's why it's so vivid, you know, with me that I was moved, so moved that I don't know if I, if I was teary eyed or what have you in that conversation because 
it's not all the time that I have a spouse, you know, reach out to say that I want to make sure that I have um, this much life policy, life coverage, because if something happens to me, I want to make sure that my wife and my kids, etc. Sometimes you have to like twist their arm and really have to go through all the uh, pros and cons, discovery to let them know that, hey, you got to do something to protect your family. With, with that said, when is it enough, Arno? When is it enough where, yeah, you try, you, you've done all the troubleshooting, but it's a dead horse. Is there such a thing? Um, yes, I'd say there is such a thing. And <clears throat> that is also a choice, right? Um, a choice, a decision needs to be followed with actions. I can't say, oh, I love that person and then don't express my love. That, that doesn't work. Um, and, and that's what your client is doing. He, he makes that decision and then he follows up with actions. And is it enough is when you decide it's enough. That's also a decision. When you decide I could go, I could go through coaching and, and couples counseling with that person for five years and maybe that would do something. And then you say, yes, and I want to do that. I want to put in that effort or you say, no, I, I really, I really don't want that. I'm really, I really don't want it anymore. Or you notice there are things going on that I'm not okay with, and that actually made me make me afraid, and for good reason, right? It's not like oh, my anxiety kicks in. It's like that is that is scary. Like for example, when the partner has anger issues. And the tra trajectory is not an, an, is going upwards, or mm -hmm. when the partner is using drugs and exposing the kids to that environment. And I had a I had a client. She started working with me with the intention of saving the marriage, and through the empowerment that she experienced through coaching, at some point she realized I'm tagging along with those things, and and I'm not okay with those. I love him. And if he stops with that, I can continue the the, the relationship. But for now, I, no. And then she makes that made that decision with confidence, right? Right. So I guess if if it involves a abuse, alcoholism, gambling, and um, and the person doesn't want to seek help, then that's when I guess that's it. I can I can still choose to stay in the relationship. As long as there's hope, as long as, as, as I have hope, I stay in the relationship, right? Um, so I would never, I've never given anyone the advice to, to end, end a relationship. When I noticed that their safety is, is at risk, that there's a risk for their safety, then I will have a conversation about that and what they think they need to do to create a, a, and, and be in a healthy and, and safe environment. But mm -hmm. uh, it's not my responsibility to tell someone what to do globally, like what, what life decisions to make. But mm -hmm. I give people tools to make those decisions in an empowered way. And I like I, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. So it's not like, aha, I saw alcohol. <laughs> Just kidding. <Yeah. laughs> I saw this. That's get enough. out of there! <laughs> <laughs> he drinks. Yes. Get out of there! No, you're you're right. You're right. Again, agree. It is really a decision. It's a choice with everything. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, there's the the thing about the three C's, right? You have to take a chance to make a choice to make a change, something like that. Mm. Um, so what do you what do you um what do you say about uh, the saying behind the success? And failure of a man is a woman. <laughs> is there truth in that, or is it just like a romantic way, ro romanticizing relationship? I think it's true, um, because leadership leaderships goes through three stages from my perspective. Number one is leadership of self, self leadership, and look when when I first heard the term, a good leader is a good follower. I thought that was bullshit. Excuse my language. I was like, how's it? 
a leader tells others what to do. Why would he be a good follower? Or why should she be a good follower? And then someone told me, well, a good leader is a good follower of self. You give yourself instructions and follow them. And if you don't do that, you're not even leading yourself if you're not a good follower. Right. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're a good leader of yourself, you can be a good leader of your family. And you and your partner have different strengths and weaknesses. And if you try to lead in an area of your weakness and their strength, mm. you're going to lose authority. You're going to mess up the specific situation. And if you do it long enough and, and severely enough, you, you mess up the global situation, right? The, the overall relationship. So you have to follow in, 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 in certain areas and be a good leader of self, knowing your strengths and weaknesses. And when you are a good leader of yourself, a good leader in your home, then yeah. you can be a good leader in your business. And at home, you want to have a strong partner and have and be a power couple, right? Of two strong people who are who empower each other and not two bosses who become a power struggle, which you also mm. see sometimes. Mm -hmm. right so and then it also goes both ways it's, it's like happy wife happy life it's true right it's yeah, a yeah very powerful thing to say it's a very powerful tip an empowering tip that one husband can give another husband very empowering if one wife gives that advice to another wife it's disempowering because it then one wife tells the other wife that her husband is the problem and she can do nothing about it, right? It's disempowering. And when a wife tells her husband, it's just manipulation. It's just like, so, my happiness is more important. You can't do that, right? So for our audience out there, if there's one major takeaway <laughs> in this episode, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I know. Um, for those that are in love, right? But... Um, there's just major difference, let's say, in religion, right? Culturally, uh, speaking, upbringing, etc. So yes, they're in love, but there's just all these forces that seem to tear them apart. What would be a good uh, solution to that? Or is it still even something that one, you know, is it really going against the grain and don't even bother with it? Um. What you're talking about is, is cultural differences. Cultural, between... religious, um, you know, upbringing, you know, type of, uh, yeah. of situation. Yeah. And, and I believe every, every couple runs into those issues at some point, more, more, more or less. And the, the key to that is, um, is effective communication and effective communication, um, can be very, can be very misunderstood because effective mm -hmm. communication doesn't mean efficient communication. There is no efficient communication. I think uh, the first time I read it was, was Stephen Covey, Seven, Seven Habits of, of High Successful People. You can't expect to get an instant result, even if you express yourself as effective as possible because that, that only happens in Hollywood movies. You know, person A yells at person B and person B goes like, Oh, you're right. I'm going to do that. No, that, that uh -huh. doesn't happen. <laughs> it happens in the movies. So it needs to sink in. It needs to be re repeated, right? So you, when you communicate effectively, many people think when I communicate effectively, I'll get an instant result, but it needs to sink in. It, it may take a couple of days, sometimes only a couple of minutes, but sometimes a couple of days or weeks to, to really sink in, to, to get a point across. Um, I mean, even if I read a book or if, if one reads a book, we comprehend about 20 to 30% of what was said. So, so reading a book multiple times helps to really absorb all the content and being able to, to use it. And the same is with, with conversations. And it depends on what state of mind one is in and what, what how happy or sad one is when they, uh, hear that information so being if and so so what does effective communication mean in the end it means shifting the likelihood that you're going to be understand 
Uh, understood. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. shifting the odds. It's not a magic trick where mm-hmm. you communicate effectively and then this and this happens. No, it's when you communicate effectively, there's a higher likelihood that the person listening to you will understand you and, and agree with you. Mm-hmm. Hey, how about monogamy? Is that, uh, I think especially in Hollywood, <laughs> is that a myth? Is monogamy a myth? Um, no, it's not a myth. If you look, if you look into, in the, into the uh, animal kingdom, there are even species like penguins or, or albatrosses who are monogamous. So yeah, it, it's not like it's not a fiction. It 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 it's real, um, and and animals do that. There are also animals that don't, and humans adopt certain characteristics of of different kinds of animals. Right? There are hunters. There are gatherers. There are meat eaters. There are plant eaters. There are monogamous people, and there are not monogamous people. Um, I'm monogamous, and um, I believe there's a there's a there's a benefit. Uh, personally, I believe it's it's a very healthy way to to lead a life and to um, to lead a healthy live a healthy family life. In my in my um, in my work, when I speak with people who who cheat, who have been cheated on, um, who have had parents that cheated. Um, which is in the end not not honoring monogamism, right? In that way, um, it's 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 difficult for those people. It is it's very difficult for kids to be in an environment of parents that are not monogamous. That that's what I see. On the other hand, you know, if if it doesn't float your boat, right? If it floats your boat to to be what's it polyg- poly- poly- polygamous? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what it's called, right? Um, you you can do that. I would hope to not bring kids into that environment, because I believe for children it's important to be raised by monogamous parents. To be happy, you know, it's it's good to be in a healthy uh, relationship. What I personally know to be true, and others can can know other things to be true. What I know to be true is. Um, the people that live longest are in happy, sustainable, long-term relationships. Being in an environment where you are cared for and where you care for someone else is good for one's health and longevity. Um, and that can just, put, if you look, and that, that that is globally, like the marriage in itself, the the life overall, but it can also be, in the moment where, where where one partner is frustrated, right? And you can take their frustration personal and try to help them and try to make them happy again. And that doesn't work because their body is flooded with cortisol and adrenaline. And they're looking at everything through that lens and, and trying to find, find the, uh, threats and everything you say. May, may it be happy or, or loving or anything. Um, or you just show an act of kindness. You bring them a glass of their favorite beverage or ask them if you can do something for them. And if they say no, you say, okay. Then you tell them where you're going to spend the next minutes or hours. Like, I'm going to be uh, reading in the living room. Just let me know if you, if you want to talk. And then you go there. And that's the essence of holding space, right? So now you've mm-hmm. shown an act of kindness. They know someone cares for them. You are available for them if they if you want if they want to talk. And now you've created an environment for them, a local environment that promotes them metabolizing those stress hormones. Mm-hmm. So it and, helps with it helps yeah. with immunity and therefore longevity, right? Yeah. Being in that that type of environment, I could I could say that there is truth to that. You know, growing up with um, with you know my grandparents. You know, both in their nineties, you know, later nineties, you know, considering, you know, back in the days, third world country, you wouldn't think, right? But I just saw love, you know, between the two of them. Um, really, it's crazy how, um, 
you know, without being, without being overly expressive, you can feel, you can feel the love, the support, um, that they had for each other. And yeah, so fulfilling life until the end of, of their life, right? Uh, and I guess that messed me up because in my head, I'm thinking it has to be like that. <laughs> it has to be like, like my, uh, my parents, but you know, with regards to longevity, if, if what you're saying, you know, could be reflected there, then, then, there's that that truth there. Yeah. Right? Maybe we can talk a little bit about conflicts. Uh-huh. Because w- what I was wondering as you as I was sharing that, did you ever see them argue or have conflicts with each other? Yeah, 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 because my mother, yeah. my grandmother is very uh strong. It's a more okay. matriarchal society. Um but my grandfather and that's good. Yeah, but my grandfather, I could vividly remember, he is so smooth. He is very calm. And um he would say it in uh in our language, Walayan. That means that's nothing. Everything is that's nothing. He's so cool, he's so calm. And he just smiles, you know, when my, my grandmother would be like this. He'd be like, Okay, all right. <laughs> they say happy life, happy wife, and just say yes. <laughs> no. But um he just has a way. He just has a way of uh, of um, diffusing it or letting it roll. You know. Beautiful. <laughs> and that is so important. I think it is so important that parents, grandparents, solve their conflicts in front of the children, because there are uh-huh. parents who don't do that, and that leaves the kids confused because we learn from our parents how to go about a conflict. And if parents solve conflicts in an empowered way with each other, they're setting their children up for success by doing by doing the same. So it's very powerful. And there's this another myth, another another relationship myth, where people say, wait, well, when I find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, then there will be no conflicts anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not true because we are in conflicts with ourselves all the time. Do you know what they're right. called? What? They're called decisions and finding out that you've made a mistake. Every single time you discover that you made a mistake or that you have to make a decision, you're in a conflict with yourself. Right. And we make about 35,000 decisions every day. Most of them, are, of course, tiny and unconscious. But as long as you can stop making decisions and making mistakes, you will always be in conflict with yourself and your partner does the same. So of course there will always be conflict. It's just that healthy in healthy relationships, the partners go about those conflicts in a different way. And that uh, brings me to the saying, which I think is awesome. You know, there's no such thing as perfect marriage. It's two imperfect people that refuse to give up on each other. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> It is, it is, it is very beautiful. And it's, uh, it goes in line with uh, an old couple that was asked, what made your, what made your marriage last? And they said, well, we never fell out of love uh, at the same time. Yes, there are tough times. There are difficult moments. There are challenges in, in every relationship. I mean, um, pregnancy, children, moving house, changing job, maybe even changing career. Um, uh, sicknesses or, or, or injuries of partners or, or family members. Those are big, big challenges that, that disrupt a life and a relationship and that have a big impact on how one feels. Someone can, can have, have a depression or get in, go through a depressive moment and, and, and time. And um, sticking with each other, being empathetic about it, keeping mm-hmm. judgment as little as possible and uh, and working through it it's it's work a marriage is work a relationship if if someone made a mistake and it's a huge one let's say infidelity you got caught etc have you experienced working with a couple like that and was it salvaged was it really solved was it really forgiven and forgotten oh well I don't think it'll be ever forgotten, but forgiven to the degree where it's still healthy for both of them to be together. 
It it can be. The prerequisite is that the person who who did it takes massive action to show that it was wrong. Like acknowledging it as a mistake and working with a coach, working with a therapist to show the other person that they're really putting in effort that it's not going to happen again and, and working on themselves. It is not done with an apology. You can't just just pay lip service and, and, and think everything's going to go back to normal. It's not. But if you put in the work, if you apologize profusely and in a way that it really lands, and there's a way to do that, you can you can salvage the relationship. And I've seen relationships being salvaged. So what's important in that moment is to make a to make a forever apology. You know, you know those apologies where someone apologizes one, two, three, four times and says, Come on, I've apologized. How how I often do I need it. to apologize yeah. until you understand? Well, that wipes all the apologies off the table and shows entitlement and not and not, not compassion and makes it very difficult. But if you say, look, I deeply regret what I've yeah. what I've done. I'm working on it. I wish I could undo it. And I will apologize for this every single time it will ever come up for the rest of our lives. And it's okay to bring it up because you have all the right to bring it. You would have the right Aww. to leave me now. And I'm so appreciative that you don't because I really love you and want to stay with you. And I will apologize for this forever. And then you do that without without any, I'm sorry, but, right? But really only only acknowledging how it must have made them feel. And, and th then it can be salvaged. It can be salvaged with a, with a, with a golden necklace. Because then that's the cheating necklace, and who wants to wear such a thing? You just create a re constant reminder that will that will bring it to the forefront of their mind every single time they they, they see that item. So sex in uh, in relationship, how crucial is that for their relationship to work? I think it's very important. I think it's very important um, because. A relationship is not only an intellectual thing or an unconscious thing. It's also it also has a physicality to it, mm -hmm. and it's it, it's chemistry. I mean, our hormones, our emotions are chemistry, right? Um, and during sex, there, there's an interaction that that solidifies the relationship. So it is it is very important. It can also be acknowledged that there might be phases where it doesn't happen as often. And that doesn't mean that the other person doesn't, doesn't love one anymore um, or um, any, Less. or, or <laughs> take, yeah, or, or taken personally. I mean, some women love to have more sex during pregnancy. Some don't want any sex at all during pregnancy. Some love to have sex after pregnancy. Some don't, right? It's it's very individual, and it's up to up to the man to man up, <laughs> and and acknowledge it and not take it personal and not put their own needs, and which are driven by their hormones, right? Their testosterone that wants them to to, to have sex over the hormones of the other person, over the needs of the other person, which can be mm -hmm. something different, and having phases in a relationship where sex mm -hmm. happens less can be okay and, and, and be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so Arno, for our audience out there who want to learn more about your services, what is the best way for them to reach you? Um, my, my website, um, imagine-evolution.com is a good way. Uh, my Instagram underscore Arno Koch, A R N O K O C H, uh, is good. Or, or just Google Arno Koch, A R N O K O C H. Um, I, I noticed that the first first page is plastered with with links to um, to to my my pages in social media. So that's that's a good way. Hey, uh, so 
imagine evolution. Uh, both words I really like, you know. So imagine that's where everything starts, right? When you when you imagine things. So I love that. And I also am a firm believer of uh, of evolution. We just really have to keep evolving, right? Keep evolving to always to elevate ourselves and to be uh, the best version of ourselves. So, so Arno, I, I enjoyed our, um, our interaction uh, this morning and I wish you continued success. Thank you so, so much. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Loved it. And for all our dreamers out there, keep believing. You got this. Till next time. 